Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having conversations with the brightest and best minds I can find to help inspire all of us to make amazing products, amazing product teams, and amazing product companies. Now, tonight we're going to talk all about speaking to users and a book about the same. If you want to grab a copy of the book after you listen to this, I've only gone and got you a 20% discount code. If that sounds interesting, head over to portugal.com slash books and go and pick up the second edition of Interviewing Users from the publisher, Rosenfeld Media. You can use code NIGHT with a K to get 20% off. And no, I don't get a kickback. It's all for you. And hopefully you can use your slightly cheaper book wisely. Make sure to check the show notes for more details. So, talking to users. You'd think this would be table stakes these days, but apparently not. So, how can we get our sceptical business leaders to the table in the first place? What are the pros and cons of continuous discovery versus point-in-time research? What do the best user interviewers have in common with improv artists? For answers to all these questions and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Steve Portugal. Steve's a renowned user researcher and author who started out selling flowers at the side of a two-lane highway until the flower shop owners realized not many people wanted to pull over and impulse purchase a bouquet giving Steve his first experience of founder-led decision-making without any real evidence behind it. <laughs> Steve has since had a long and storied career in user research, literally storied in one memoir of war stories, as well as expressed more practically in a classic book, Interviewing Users, recently re-released as a second edition, and a book that aims to help us all uncover compelling insights. So no pressure at all for me to perform in this interview in the presence of the master tonight. Hi, Steve. How are you doing tonight? Good. And no pressure for me to perform either. So. <laughs> right let's just no pressure on either of us it's going to be a mexican standoff we'll both be trying to out interview each other for the duration of the interview but i'm i'm here for it i'm here what, for what it. makes you say that no no just <laughs> i'm just kidding it's just the gun it's just the gun anyway <laughs> so first things first you are the principal at portugal consulting You've got a long and storied as we discussed in the intro 22 year career consulting with all types of companies, but what are you specifically solving for your clients these days? You know, I help clients with a handful of different kinds of problems or challenges. One is I do user research. I have clients that want to understand something about a particular set of customers. They don't know how to get it. They don't have anyone to help them do that. It's sticky or political or just nuanced. So I'm there I'm their partner of choice. Let's learn about these customers and figure out how we're going to change our processes, our products. We're going to apply this research to something. And I have clients that want to be better at doing research themselves. They want to build their skills. And so they are asking me to look at their processes, look at their practice, kind of look not at their customers in the first example, but look at them. How is the research being done? What skills do people have? What skills are people lacking? So I might come in and train people and give them, you know, a little taste of what research could be and coach them independently, kind of review maybe uh, what research looks like. One group wants X, the group that provides it thinks that they want Y. It's actually what we do in research, right, is find disconnects between what one group says and what the other group says, even with the same words. So, of course, that goes on inside organizations. It's fun to do that because you get to apply research as a process to research as a practice. And I don't know if that's turtles all the way down or something, but yeah. (laughs) So those are kind of the two areas I focus on right now. Now, I like that thing that you said there about effectively almost applying research to research or research for the good of research. And it reminds me of a thing that I occasionally say when I'm trying to make the case for, for example, B2B product managers to maybe have a bit more empathy with the rest of their organization. And I think you talk about this a bit in the book as well, this idea about like, it's really common for a product manager to complain in a certain type of organization that they don't get to do as much user research, don't get to talk to as many customers as maybe they want to. But they almost steadfastly refuse to make any real efforts, do any kind of user research on the the sales team or the, the marketing team or any other teams in the organization. So it kind of feels like a similar sort of energy there, this idea that the skills that you've got as you say, they can be used to go out and find insights from customers, but they can also be used to really deeply understand an organization. So do you feel that then that's a it's almost like a double superpower then because you've got that deep ability to empathize with and dig out and kind of get to the truth of the situation? 
Yeah, I don't know. Is it a double superpower or just the same superpower? I'm going to just get pedantic on how many, <laughs> how many superpowers is it you really? You can charge twice for it. Yeah, I mean, I think to do, even when you're doing, even when research is applied to somebody outside the company, you still have to do some of what you're talking about to influence or impact or you're, you know, great research is about changing minds. I think to like, hey, we thought this, but now we learned this. It's not just so even when I am, you know, talking to my clients, customers and users, I still have to do some work to understand how they make decisions, what their assumptions are. You know, I don't know if it's literally user research, like in the other example with your with your PMs, but it is you you have to look inwards and you have to look outwards. And it's obviously different for me as a consultant than it is for someone who's, you know, a B2B product manager is part of that system. They're part of that organization. So there may not be as obvious to them to sort of, yeah, turn that lens inward, look at their, look at their colleagues. So back in the day, it was all consultants. And so we always looked, you know, in, into these different realms. And now there are so many people on these teams doing this stuff that, yeah, I think you're wise to help them see that because it's not obvious when you're on the inside that there's also a culture that you're in that you should look at with these tools. No, absolutely. But talking of culture and companies, like the companies that you're working with at the moment or in general, are they all kind of trendy SaaS startups, all testing out their latest AI-powered innovations? Or are you also doing some research for larger companies, enterprises, maybe even shock horror, physical products? Yeah, I think, yes, all, all of the above. Yeah, re- not that long ago, I worked with a company that does... Um, they were like a financial payments company for a for a very specific industry. And I think in the intro call I had with them, they, they said, okay, well, we're 10 years behind. And I mean, the more I learned about them and their industry and the sort of state of the art in those practices, they were not kidding. So there's, yeah, there's lots of stuff to be done in, I don't know, I, I, I want to say non-sexy, but of course, any any problem space, once you get into it, is really interesting and exciting. and but. It's not the shiny, shiny, I think. And in fact, some of that stuff moves too fast for, it's not that there's no research being done there, but maybe folks that come to me don't tend to be the, I liked your kind of riff about whatever the new something, something was. That's not, I don't tend to be the <laughs> the provider of choice for kind of the latest trend product category. I'm not, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but yeah, it's, it's good to have a mix, I think, for me to have a mix of different organization types, different product types, different sizes, different points in their growth cycle, because you just see all sorts of interesting contrasts and sort of understand how A relates to B or B relates to Q and so on. No, absolutely. And I just have to say, as someone who's spent a rather long time working in the market research industry, I'm never going to talk down to traditional industries. I've definitely seen my share of shampoo bottle concept tests in my time. But let's get away from you as such and talk about your books, or rather one of your books, because you do have two books. You have Doorbells, Danger and Dead Batteries, which I believe is a collection of war stories from the field. That's right. And you've also got Interviewing Users, which is a much more practical book, desk reference for, well, interviewing users. But that book's pretty old now, so you've come up with a second edition. So why was now the right time to dust off the old typewriter and start updating that book? I like your image of me using a typewriter. That's really, that's really sweet. Yeah, like Misery, you know, like the film Misery. Yeah. Well, the reason he wrote that book was he was forced to, right? So yeah, no one, no one locked me up and hobbled me and forced me to to write this new edition. (laughs) Right. It's been 10 years. And uh, I was really like, part of me just selfishly was thinking about commemorating that. Like that's the, that's an anniversary that I think for me personally, it was very meaningful and maybe, and this sounds a, maybe a little privileged, but I think for the field, it's also an interesting anniversary. And so, um, yeah, it just, it got me thinking, well, what, because I, for years I thought, well, I'm never, I would never do a second edition of this book because in my mind it's evergreen. And yes, there's some things I left out, but I, so I think this 10 year thing pushed me a little bit and I, I sat down and said like, okay, what, what would I want to talk about? Like what has changed? What's missing and what has changed? And, you know, without even opening the book, I came up with sort of five or six things. And it got me a little more excited to think like, oh, yes, that there's more to say. And there's things that I can say better. And there's stuff that I left out. And there's just 
There's things like research operations. If you're unaware of that, that's a whole practice that's about like empowering organizations to do research. I'm sure research ops person would say better than me, but let's just use that as a definition. That didn't exist 10 years ago. The just the infrastructure and logistics, which is not what research ops does, but you know, it's sort of a thing that we can see happen if we're researchers or people doing research. We just we were figuring a lot of that out as we went. Compliance processes were kind of lax or kind of emergent. And so you can really see just from from that point of view, like, oh, the field is really matured. We have you know, we have infrastructure, we have people that build and identify infrastructure, we have compliance, we have research as an in-house practice, which we had some of 10 years ago. But, you know, I think who I was writing to 10 years ago was sort of less clear. And I think that, you know, you brought up right away earlier in this conversation, PMs doing research, and that that's just a natural course of things. That was not the case 10 years ago. So who's out there? What do we want to kind of talk to them about? You know, one thing that happened with COVID and lockdown is that research became an entirely remote activity. It's not like we didn't have remote user research. Nate Bolt wrote a book about that in 2010. But it all became that during the pandemic. And that led to a lot of struggle and different tactics. And, and, you know, a lot of the guts kind of changed for research as well as the mindset. And it, I think we're still, there's still a lot to learn. I don't think we have all the answers here, but that's a thing that's changed that, you know, you can't talk about research now in 2023 without sort of acknowledging that that's, that's a shift in things. So anyway, long ramble about just the, the thought process and some of the things that were sort of driving me to, to come back and revisit this after 10 years. No, absolutely. I think it's a really interesting story about some of the things that you learned. I mean, I'm sure you learned a lot of things as you went through your intervening 10 years, still going out and honing your own craft as well, right? So I guess, I mean, you've kind of touched on it a little bit, this idea that there's a lot that's stayed the same and there's a lot that's changed because ultimately we human beings are the same old bags of meat with the same old cognitive biases driving us as we were 10 years ago more or less right like yeah sure we've got a little bit of extra tech but we're still the same creatures so how much of the fundamentals do you feel needed totally rewriting versus just effectively leaving a lot of what was already there kind of mainly untouched with a few tweaks and adding some new stuff versus kind of rewriting some of the old fundamental skill side of it as well i think it was a mix in the writing process like rewriting something is just a fascinating sort of creative project. And, uh, you know, once you sort of open the hood, you can start changing everything. Like you're in there, so you might as well fix something, polish it up, add another example. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the fundamental ideas are are untouched and some of that text is untouched. But, you know, where maybe I might have described, I think there was in the first edition, there was like, oh, here's a couple of challenges you might face. And I think in this you know, going back to it, I came up with a much longer list of things that go wrong in an interview. So the the question is the same, but we have five times as many answers uh, as we had before. So yeah, I, I really like that's you're describing my resistance to ever wanting to rewrite it to begin with. Like, oh, this the work <laughs> is the work. Interviewing is interviewing. Follow up is follow up. But as you said, I've learned a lot by doing it for ten years and teaching it for ten years, and you know, just have more kinds of practical tips and tricks to to kind of extend it. So, yeah, I think yes and no. Like it's the same, and it's 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 fleshed out. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, obviously, I think it's always good to rewrite stuff for the new age as well. You know, just like George Lucas putting Jabba the Hutt into certain scenes and stuff. Like, there's always room to go back and improve on the uh, original works, right? But if we talk about interviewing users, the concept versus the book itself, as in the thing that the book's talking about, there are quite a few people talking about discovery these days, or customer development as it was in the old days, or interviewing users as it was in your days, and now is again. So do you get the feeling these days, thinking about things that have stayed the same and things that have changed, that at least the idea of doing user research and that that's a good thing to do is a solved problem? Or do you think it's still somewhat controversial in some quarters? 
It's, I don't think it's a, there's some shades of gray to that. That's a really important question. I think there's some shades of gray. Everybody's familiar with it or they're familiar with what they think it is. Everyone agrees, at least verbally, that some version of this thing should be done. I think we run into the gaps where, so yes, there are pockets of like, you know, unmitigated arrogance. We don't need to do this. We know. I think there are very pragmatic resource questions. Do we have the people? Do we have the skills? What does it take to do this? Do we have time? What decisions do we have to make? And I think, you know, when you don't have kind of leadership or experience, navigating that is maybe hard and maybe you don't always make the right decisions. I think it takes some sophistication to to think about that. And I just looping back to what I was kind of implying before, if research is an other, if interviewing users is kind of an other to you, you don't really understand it like someone with a lot of experience. There's a lot of ways to do it. There are less effective ways to do it. And so you get these kind of biased rejections like, uh, and these are sort of classic among legendary business leaders. Why would I ever ask anyone what they want? So I don't want to do research or we're not going to do research until we've decided what we're going to make so that we can see if that's what people want. And so these are, well, the first example is kind of not someone you necessarily want to work for. The second example is earnest, but misguided. So if you don't, this is a really long way of saying, If you don't understand all of what research can provide, all of what interviewing users can provide, then you don't necessarily deploy it at the right level at the right time, or you assume that it won't fit resource-wise or decision or influencing in terms of that. So, you know, the more deep knowledge people have, the more experience, the more sophistication they have, the more they're able to deploy interviewing users as the right kind of tool at the right time to make the right decisions. And that, yeah, that's, you know, that takes leadership, that takes experience, that takes understanding it more than just, oh, we do a usability test or we, whatever sort of method is people's kind of go-to thing. So yeah, that's why my answer is a little more complicated than your question might've hoped. No, I like to get multiple layers out of my guests as much as I can with deliberately simplistic questions. So long may that continue. But one of the things that kind of comes to mind as you were describing some of those scenarios is that it's not necessarily that people don't think that talking to users or in B2B terms, talking to customers is a particular problem. But in some cases, it's who does it and the level to which they do it and how deep they go. Because one really common thing that you get back, for example, in a B2B context is, oh, well, the sales team and the customer support teams or the the account managers are out there talking to users and talking to the end users and talking to the customers all the time. So we can just kind of use what they say, like they're people too, right? But why would you or would you consider that a mistake to just rely on that type of feedback? Yes, it's a mistake. I mean, I think the the mindset here is the yes and from improv. Those people are, you know, the the, the job roles that you described and the the information that they are gathering is incredibly important and insightful and should raise questions like, why is this happening? You know, and I think that goes back to what I was saying before about, oh, research is just asking people what they want or asking them where things aren't working for them. And it's much, much more than that. And so those, if you, if you have sort of a, an impoverished model of what interviewing users can bring you, then you're going to look to those functions as providing everything. But those should be inputs. Um, if I'm going to do some research and I can learn what, like what support is hearing and where they're seeing, uh, you know, pains and challenges or what questions they have for me, you know, what resistance sales is encountering or what requests they're getting. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes we think that, uh, you know, what we're going to do in research is go ask people what features they want and then figure out somehow among these competing requests, which ones to implement. And that's, that's not what interviewing users is about. It's, it's about actually finding a new interpretation, a new point of view, a new understanding, a larger framework that's built up from all those things. And so, yeah, if people tell us what they want to tell us, they're going to tell us what features they want. But we have other questions for them. How do you work? Why do you work that way? What other tools are you using? 
How has that changed? What has led to the definition of that as like a work process? How do you acquire new tools and technology? What's been successful when you've rolled things out? What's been a challenge when you've rolled things out? I mean, I'm just riffing here on the kinds of things we want to understand. It's all setting context because, yeah, what people ask for, you know, let's say someone says, I want to, you know, I want a carrot to come with everyone. You know, if you write down wants carrot and then you have to decide, can we include a carrot in this or not from a cost, you know, bill of materials point of view, that's one thing. If you don't ask them, like, why do you want a carrot? And why is snacking important to you? Or do you mean carrot the vegetable or carrot the way that we rate diamonds? Like, there's so much more to understand. And my examples are, you know, super stupid. I apologize. But (laughs) we're trying to get beyond. I'd say that fits the attitude of the podcast. All right. We're on brand. Good. All right. I'm glad that I could could fit with the brand with the carrot puns. <laughs> you right, you got to get below and get below and get below and get below. So that's 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 method, but again, the stuff that you get from these other functions, these are hypotheses, these are sources of questions, these are you know, areas where there's like where people are scratching about things, you want to kind of look at what that is. Super super valuable and I think vice versa, right? I think what you learn in research absolutely feeds back to all these functions it, it applies to you know hey salespeople the pain point we've been hearing about this is because of these other reasons we we understand the context more so you know how might you think about i don't know positioning the the benefit of these features a little bit differently because we understand the the context a little bit more so i think it's you know it's bi-directional everybody kind of helps everybody gain a richer, more contextual, insightful picture of what's going on with these folks and how, what are all the different ways that we can help them? I agree with everything that you just said. It all makes sense to me. And it's all something that you'll see from a number of different commentators out there about the kind of general topic of user research discovery. Like that's something that I'm all bought into, but there's a bunch of people out there. We've kind of touched on it already. Some of the people out there that maybe doubt that this is a thing that we need to do or need to do it in a way that you would advocate. They're going to listen to that and be like, well, what? And there's going to be a bunch of people that are trying to persuade those people to try and let them do some of this stuff that don't have any tools in their toolkit to say, well, you know, Steve says this, so we should do this. So like, obviously, when you're going into companies, people have hired you. So I guess there's a certain sort of self-selection there. But at the same time, have you ever managed to come up with ways to maybe persuade a slightly wary or doubtful leadership team that this is actually a good thing to do and something that they should give you a bit more rope to uh, hang yourself with? I mean, I think there's elements of that in every in every relationship. Like this happens even before they agree to hire me. Somebody has identified a need, but it doesn't mean that everyone has bought in. You know, even once. So once we're starting, you know have had these great kickoff meetings where everyone's come with their assumption about what this project's going to be. There already is a scope of work enough to go through corporate procurements and like, you know, there are artifacts there, but you know, people still have different ideas about what it's going to be. And I still try to do yes. And there where possible, like what are all the objectives? What are all the concerns? What are all the risks here? And that doesn't scope creep the project. I think it just helps set it in context. And so that, You know, I am asking questions and I'm, this is back to what I said before about, you know, setting the specifics of the project. Like, what are we going to actually do in a way that responds to these concerns and these objectives? So there's lots that can change without changing the, the scope. It's not like someone says, Oh, we have this concern. And I think, well, we have to rewrite the statement of org. I don't think that's the case for a lot of it because in fact, you know, people don't usually in those those kickoff meetings aren't coming to say, oh, we also want to talk to customer group A and customer group Q. Their concerns or their misunderstandings or their objectives are more fundamental about what are we as a business trying to do, right? That Those folks aren't, they're not project managers. They're trying to solve their objectives. And so sometimes they might misunderstand the method or what the method's going to bring them. And so that's a moment to sort of say, you know, yes, we're going to address the question that you have, and we're going to do it this way. You know, where we can, it's nice to collaborate with people. And obviously, the higher up you go in the organization, the less the less you want to kind of bother them in handling the day-to-day stuff. 
So figuring out your racy or your daisy, your uh, your responsible, accountable, consulted, informed, like what are the roles of all these folks? You kind of want to understand that and you know engage with them at the right at the right level. But I think this point you're making about who has concerns or suspicions or objections or uncertainties should inform kind of how you how you engage with them. You know, taking people into the field, whether that's remote or like going into a Burger King with them, that obviously is a time investment on their part. I'm not asking people that I work with to be researchers or to go to a bunch of interviews, but to go to to one and hear how hear what I I mean this sounds super arrogant, but I have got this as a compliment. <laughs> hear what I'm able to draw out of somebody because I'm gonna ask these different questions. And I think Seeing is believing, right? In, in those cases, no, absolutely. And obviously, that's one of the big benefits of being able to do stuff online. At least, is you know, you can record the things and you can play them back pretty effortlessly, even if you can't get people to come along with you. But you know, at the same time, got to love the face to face where you can. But speaking of some of the, let's call them competitor books out there that talk about this sort of stuff, and this is something you mentioned in your book as well. There are certain books out there that refer to the pros and cons of continuous research, you know, doing something as a continuous ongoing initiative rather than maybe the more project-based research that you talk about in the book and that you probably get involved in more with the engagements that you have with clients. So as far as you're concerned, what are some of the pros and cons of continuous research versus that point in time? Because it feels to me that some of the resistance is because they feel that it's a project that's going to take time at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I, it, there's sort of what's the pros and cons of doing it and what are sort of the barriers to doing it because, and I'm maybe, uh, uh, you know, over my skis a little bit here, but to set up and commit to continuous research, you know, it's, that seems to me like a pretty significant challenge. Like, oh, you didn't want to do research before this project? Guess what? We're always going to be doing research. <laughs> I mean, I think there's some models of that that are different. Like sometimes it's called rapid research. And I, the way I see this being done is, and I, I think it's different than continuous research, but you can help me where I have the terminology wrong. To me, to me rapid research is, hey, we're going to have, we're going to talk to five users every week. And so somebody owns that and they kind of go and find out who has questions and kind of bring those questions in. So there's always going to be some information. You, we, have a, we have a sketch on Monday. We're going to get feedback on, from it on Friday, something else different uh, the next week. You know, I think something like that is great because it's immediate and you kind of decouple the, it's it's infrastructure, right? We have like a, a, a spigot. We can turn that spigot on at any time we need to kind of get something from it. That limits you, I think, method wise. If you want to really go deep, you have to be, you have to work at what your question is. You have to match who you're going to talk to and build a method around that to get to the thing you couldn't otherwise get to. So that you can't do that in rapid research. And I guess I'm, you know, I just don't know enough about sort of implementing continuous discovery. And I, I've heard that, you know, when the people talk about continuous, they are folding in not just the research part, but they're talking about sort of research design development as kind of an integrated piece that happens in these continuous cycles. And so, you know, the more tightly you couple it, I think the more, Right. If, if the people doing the research and acting on the research are, are part of the same flow, that seems like that's going to reduce the, hey, we did this project. We have some things to learn. Where are you at now that seven weeks have gone by and how are you going to act on this? So I think, you know, the more you tightly couple it, the better your chances of, you know, impact are. But again, you're just, I think it, it constrains you methodologically. It constrains you from a sample point of view which may be great, right? That you may not, I wouldn't say that every project needs to have that every time you ever talk about even the design of this one thing we're making, you don't need to kind of go back to first principles every time. But I think, you know, that project up front, which might take some delay if we don't, you know, if we don't sort of start early enough, should be one that is challenging a lot of assumptions and maybe is more generative than evaluative. But as you kind of move along, Maybe you kind of transition to something that's more continuous or more rapid research where you just need some like very fundamental feedback kind of on an ongoing basis, but not 
challenging the positioning of this, the narrative of it, how it integrates with other tools, what the work process is, how they do or don't trust your company to be a provider of it. Like those are essential questions, but they're not essential questions always every time, every interview or every stage of the project. So it sounds like in classic product management terms, it depends just like everything else. But it also sounds like you're basically recommending kind of keeping both in your toolbox, right? Like you being able to use the right tool for the right method and getting the right results out of it that depending on what it is that you need. Is that fair? Yeah. In addition to right tool, right method, right objectives, I would say right culture, right? What is the, this? these things fit differently with different sort of product maturities, design maturities, research maturities, sort of belief, you know, what's the cultural belief around our relationship to our customers? And this would be different B2B than, um, you know, than consumer facing, for example, like I think just these cultural aspects are going to, you know, inform what the right mix looks like for you. One of the things you talk about in the book is about defeating cognitive biases. So some of the classics like confirmation bias, hindsight bias, some of the classics that come up when you're talking about user research. And we've obviously all got these biases. I also like your shout out to David Dylan Thomas in the book because I've had him on the podcast before and he wrote a great book about cognitive bias in general. But how do you recommend practically limiting the impact of cognitive biases in user research, especially if you've got maybe a a slightly less experienced team that maybe aren't even aware and, and need a bit of guidance to make sure that they're not committing some of the cardinal sins of confirmation and so forth? Right. I mean, I think... You know, awareness, and I think you, you kind of nailed it in the way you even framed it, right? I think awareness of biases is a great first step. And I think that word bias is so loaded because, you know, people hear bias and they think discriminatory behavior, like, you know, bad stuff that we don't want to be part of. But cognitive bias is is different. It's how our brains are built because of how we evolved. It's and I think with awareness should come I don't want to say permission, but like forgiveness. I don't think we should be ashamed of of bias. It is it's a thing that that we have in us that we have to overcome to really I mean I maybe oversimplifying a little bit, but so yeah, like I think uh, like a just a brief conversation about bias and with some examples, how does this manifest itself? And I mean I find this so much with teaching people to do research, you know, when I teach I'll offer some practices and then they'll go try something out and they'll come back and say, that thing that you told me not to do, Steve, I found myself doing. And I always applaud them for that because they're not defending themselves. They're not saying I'm wrong. They're saying, I now see that behavior in myself and I now see. So just just like a, a concrete example here is about asking long run-on questions where you put the answers in the question. What did you have for breakfast? Did you have juice or toast? Versus what did you have for breakfast? There's a whole thing about that in the book. And so I tell people that in the lecture, then they go off and do an interview and they come back and say, wow, it was really hard. I'm surprised. It was really hard not to put the answers in the question. And so I'll tell them, "Here's here's what you should do, what you should not do. Here's why you should do it and not do it. Here's why it's going to be hard. And then they go do it. And then they experience, wow, this was hard. I knew it. I had it in the top of my mind. And I didn't know how to find my way around it. So what's happened there is they've they they've discovered something in their own behavior. So the same thing is with biases. If you start to illustrate some of these biases, confirmation bias, right? We look for a thing that we already believed. And so, yeah, there are some practices in the book you know, uh, uh, where I talk about letting go of, you know, how we, how, how we see the world, check your worldview at the door, embracing uh, other people's experiences and their worldviews. There's some very practical tips in the book about doing that. And that's, I, um, I don't think we mentioned bias there, but that is about biases and kind of preparing yourself to encounter those biases. And again, to be okay with it. So, you know, back to your group of folks, hey, biases are a thing. It's how we're wired. It's okay. We all do it. You're going to do it. Here's a handful of them. Go do the interview. Hey, what happened in the interview? Did you experience your own biases? Like what, what happened? What would you do differently next time? And so, yeah, I mean, I know Cardinal Sin is kind of a joke. You know, you're using that kind of flippantly, but <laughs> I want us to forgive ourselves. If, if we're trying to do better, 
I'm the first one to kind of harsh on people for like really crappy interviewing users practices. But anybody that's trying to do a better job and is kind of looking at themselves is like, I have so much respect for that. So yeah, that's my long speech about biases. No, absolutely. And it confirmed some of my, no, I was only joking. <laughs> uh, but no, I think it's really important to, uh, I think it's really important to give credit where credit's due, as you just said as well. Like, I think, I mean, I put something on LinkedIn about this earlier, not about interviewing, but just in general, like, just try and do a good job, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you fall, as long as you're not like actively harming someone or tanking the company. Like, there's obviously certain decisions that you could probably make that are much more impactful than others. But as long as you're trying to do a good job in good faith, I think you should, you know, basically respect that, as you just said. But talking about doing a good job, one of the things that you do call out in the book that really resonated with me actually was this idea that all of this user research is for naught if we don't make an impact with that research. Yeah, you know, we're not just doing it for research's sake. We actually want to make sure that we actually affect some kind of change with that research and that we get to do something and change our business or change our products with that research. Now, I've definitely seen situations in the past where people seem to be caught almost in infinite research cycles and they never actually get to make a decision or do anything with the results and they just end up getting overridden or overruled by a CEO who gets fed up with waiting. So how are some or what are some of the principles or practices that you like to recommend to make sure that people actually get some bang for their buck with this research? And by people, I mean the people that are doing it so that they can actually feel proud of the work and taking it forward in their organization. And I want to just, I think there's some nuance in the way you're framing it too, because I think researchers, and I differentiate that from, let's say, PMs doing research, but people with the title research sometimes discount the value of their work because somebody else didn't take action. And I think that's a heavy burden to bear. You know, we could ask those people, well, why didn't you take advantage of the research? Why is the researcher kind of always to blame? I've seen people say, oh, my research isn't valuable if no one does something. So I think collectively, like as a team or an organization, yes, we're doing research and we have the opportunity to act on it. We have the opportunity to be influential and be insightful. I don't want any one individual feel like, oh, I did all this research and I'm to blame when something else, you know, d doesn't happen. But yes, like that's a big part of our job is to, is to bring this material to people. You know, I see, uh, like, people thinking about well, what kind of output is there? What kind of deliverables are there? And I've seen great examples where organizations build in, and maybe this is more project model based, but I guess it applies to any sort of continuous research as well. They think about multiple kinds of, of documentation for research. Like, a, and I say documentation, I don't just mean like a record of what happened, but a thing that can be used by different audiences at different points to, to make decisions. So yeah, how do we archive this? And the term of the day is repository, but how do we have this information available so that other people can look at it? Now you got to ask yourself questions. Well, who are those other people? What are they going to do with it? What are they going to, what are we going to put into a repository? What are we going to pull out? I don't think this is, these are not obvious things. It's not a folder with all of our reports, right? It's it's something more about <laughs> knowledge management and decision making in the organization. So, you know, what research have we done is a way to have impact. If research is sort of ephemeral, then you 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 lose its sustained value. If you can demonstrate that we did this research and we can keep going back to it because it's accessible, it's you know, we have sort of a, a social knowledge of it. We can keep answering new questions because we already did this research. So you have to be aware of what questions are being asked. You have to be able to access the past research and you have to have the bandwidth to make those connections. But when you do that, you're telling a larger story about how not how research, how specific research is valuable, but also how research in general is valuable. So you're kind of elevating the practice, I think. What research would we want to do? Like who decides what research is going to be done? You know, the more you can be proactive about it and have a list of questions that you've uh, have uncovered, because every study or every project uncovers new things. You have awareness of what other teams are doing. And so what you might be able to provide to them at a certain point in the future. So, you know, what questions have we answered? What questions do we have? How do we kind of prioritize what we're going to do? You're trying to get out of being reactive. Hey, oh, my goodness, this thing is happening. 
we don't know something about something. Can we get that answer? Go do this research. And, you know, that is part of how we should be working. But if it's all of how we're working, then we're not leveling up the maturity, the buy-in, the sophistication, ultimately the impact. So you're trying to create the conditions where, you know, if you do study X and find insight Q and, you know, stakeholder Z is going to act on it, like you want to create the conditions for that. It doesn't happen kind of right there. So some of these, you know, more reflective and intentional sort of stepping back, I think are ways to really revisit that whole conversation and, and yeah, kind of have a larger plan going forward. Oh, absolutely. Well, obviously, big fan of making an impact and everything you just said makes a lot of sense. Almost as if you came out of it on the spot, though, which is a nice segue into my next point, which is in the book. And in fact, earlier in this interview, you talked a little bit about improv and how improv training can help you with your user research skills. Now, I've had an improv guy on before talking about how improv and product management are the same thing. So I'd be curious from a research perspective, like aside from making you quick on the draw and able to come with a witty comeback as soon as you need it, like what specific skills does improv training give you that is helpful in your user research career? I mean, I think actually doing interviews is, it's an interesting balance of being prepared and being improvisational. So, you know, improv is where you don't, take too much time, if any, to kind of plan the next thing that you're going to do. And the next thing that you do builds on the things that happened before. So like I think about interviews as uh, you, you prepare, you write a guide, but it's not a script, but you've thought through what you want to talk about. And many of your questions, in fact, like I think, you know, I have this ideal that like every question builds from the previous question. And I think part of the fun of like doing an interview is, can I ask all the questions that I came with and the questions that emerge in a way that's, that is responsive to that person? That's not, you know, great. Now let me look at my guide. Oh, question seven, this other thing, right? You want the interviews go so much better when they flow and when they build, you get richer answers. And so you, the more it's one conversation that kind of emerges. Right. And like there's improv games. I don't know. I, I could never do this, but they do an entire play. It's not written. And they do like I've done the, the three minute games, which is which is super challenging. But they do like, I don't know, let's say a 45 minute, 60 minute play. Maybe it's longer. So you're telling a very long narrative collaboratively without agreeing on how it's going to go. Well, that's an amazing interview. So I, I know I have this much time with somebody. I have all these topics I want to kind of get to. I have some intention about how I'm going to do them. And then, right, guess what, right, you know, plan meets reality, right? That it, it, it's a, there's some joke about what's the, there's a, a, a line that I don't know what it is, but about when a plan meets reality, something happens. Like that's every, <laughs> that's, that's every interview. We'll, we'll, we'll look that up for next time. Right. I'm sorry. I can't quote it. Somebody's like, oh, it's this and this and this. I mean, and <laughs> so many things happen in interviews where, oh, this is not what I thought. This, I'm not in the, I'm not in the situation I thought. They don't have the usage experience that I thought. They want to talk about something different than what I thought. You know, that's, that's what that War Stories book is about in a certain, certain amount. So what are you going to do with that? When your plan fails, you're kind of, you're out of luck. So the more you have the interview that you built together with this person that you would not have imagined was possible, the more you are getting to stuff in the field research that you didn't even know that you didn't know that you were going to kind of uncover. And that's all, that's all improv muscles that you're applying there uh, excellent and i do understand from my limited experience of improv that there are certain frameworks and techniques that you use as well to kind of almost build the scaffolding to actually improvise over as well it again feels very similar to this idea of having a plan but not sticking to it too much which i guess you could also argue is something that you know we do both of us as podcasters as well so Everything all just boils down to user research at the end of the day, just as it should be. But where can people find you after this if they want to try and tell you a joke or chat about all things user research or find out more about both your books or the new version of the one book or tap you up for just general war stories? Yeah, well, definitely all those and definitely tell me a joke. <laughs> my, uh, my, website, my website is my name, portugal.com. So you can find lots of stuff about me there. And uh, LinkedIn is where I spend a lot of time. 
So it's me, Steve Portable on LinkedIn. You can find me there and uh, yeah, look forward to connecting with people. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll make sure to link that all into the show notes and hopefully you get a few people heading your direction, asking some good quality, open-ended questions. Well, that's been a fabulous chat and hopefully my own interviewing skills pass muster. Obviously, wish you the best of luck with the second edition. Hopefully we can stay in touch. But as for now, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. It's really great to chat with you. Thanks for everything. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure you share with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night.